بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ویلکم بیک ان دا پریویس سیگمنٹ وی ڈسکسڈ سم بیسکس آف ماسٹر پروڈکشن اسکیولنگ اینڈ ان دا کانسیپٹ آف ڈس ایگریگیشن اینڈ میجر ان پٹس اینڈ آؤٹ پٹس آف ماسٹر پروڈکشن اسکیولنگ پروسیس ان پارٹ بی وی ول ڈسکس ہاؤ وی کین پریپیئر اے ماسٹر پروڈکشن اسکیول So there are three steps in preparing an MPS that is uh, to develop a preliminary MPS, check the preliminary MPS against available capacity. So that is, that process is called a rough cut capacity planning. So here we check the capacity of only critical or bottleneck resources. Uh, we do not check the capacity of each uh, resource in detail. And if there are any differences or mismatches uh, between the initial MPS and the available capacity, then we resolve those differences and, uh, and update our MPS. But in this segment, we will be focusing on step number one, that is how to develop initial or preliminary MPS. So we have repeatedly seen this uh, hierarchy. So we have a production plan that must be important point here is that at each level, whenever we make the plan, we check that plan against available capacity. So in master production scheduling, that process is called the rough cut capacity. Plan. So that is the main idea. And of course, this is the flow of the planning activities. And again, one of the major inputs to both production plan and master production schedule is demand management. And one of the major components of demand management is the demand for cost. One important concept in developing master production schedule in developing master production schedule is the concept of time fences and corresponding uh, uh, time uh, and corresponding uh, zones so time fences define the uh, three zones in mps the main goal of uh, time fences is to avoid system nervousness Uh, making too many and too frequent changes in master production schedule is not recommended because frequent adjustments to the master production schedule can lead to instability of the schedule. So that is called system nervousness. So we, we sort of restrict the planner to uh, avoid making changes after a certain time. So that is done through time fences. So time fences and time zones are used to reduce system nervousness and handle any changes to the master production schedule while still maintaining the desired level of stability. So we have an MPS grid here. So we have periods, the forecast, the customer orders, PAB, ATP, and MPS. And here you can see that we have three zones, frozen zone, slushy zone, and liquid zone. The frozen zone is decided based on demand time fence. So in this case, the demand time fence is at the end of period three. So the, period, the periods before demand time fence constitute the frozen zone. Similarly, at the end of period eight is the planning time fence. And the period between demand time fence and planning time fence, in this case, period four to eight constitute the slushy zone. And periods beyond that planning time fence constitute the liquid zone. So what is the frozen zone? So frozen zone 
is having the periods for which the change in the plan or schedule is not permissible unless it is approved by the senior manager. So in simple words, we have actually confirmed these orders and we have allocated capacity or machines or equipment to produce these orders. So change is possible, but uh, that should be uh, approved by the senior management. So sort of we have locked we have locked the plan for, in this case, the slushy zone that is between demand time fence and planning time fence is where changes are possible. But after, of course, some brainstorming and uh, discussions, and uh, of course, we have to uh, keep the production plan in place. So here sort of we have made provisional plan, you can say we have uh, maybe ordered the materials uh, for the products to be made in this period. But that provisional plan has possibility to be adjusted if required. And liquid zone is where everything is open, nothing is finalized. So this zone actually liquid zone is to improve the visibility of the master production scale so we can sort of foresee what we are expecting beyond the planning time phase. so here is a description of the three zones and the corresponding two time fences so first we have the frozen zone that is uh, determined by demand time fence. So inside this point, only customer orders are considered and not the forecast. Capacity and materials are committed to specific orders. The demand time fence usually covers the period of actual production time. Changes to the master production schedule must be approved by senior management and that is generally in extraordinary cases where change is mandatory or not making the change can have adverse uh, effects uh, for the organization. Then we have slushy zone that is between demand time fence and planning time fence. So capacity and materials are committed but not as strong as those inside the frozen zone. Changes to the schedule may adversely affect component schedules. So we have made initial plan and sort of uh, approve the purchase orders or uh, they can have uh, adverse effect on capacity plans, customer deliveries and costs. So change is possible, but that must be a calculated change. So there is room to negotiate in a slushy zone in the form of trade-offs. So for example, uh, the plan has been made, but sales team comes up with a big order, a new order. So in order to accommodate that order, the previous plan may be changed. So already committed orders may have to be negotiated with the customers to be shifted in the liquid zone. So some trade-offs are to be considered here as well. The liquid zone is created by the remaining planning horizon after the planning time fence. All changes are permissible as long as they do not violate the limits set, uh, limits, uh, set in the production plan. So as I mentioned that this liquid zone is generally to improve the visibility of the master production schedule. So the question is how we can decide the uh, length of the planning horizon. So that is an important question. So we have a final product A, that is a lead time of two. Now with the help of this example, we are going to answer this question that how much should be the length of the planning horizon. So product A end item has a lead time of uh, say two weeks. Uh, it is uh, an assembly. It has uh, three uh, components required to make uh, A, so we have 
say component or subassembly B, C, and D. And we have the lead time of six weeks for B, five for C, eight for D. And D is made up of E that has a lead time of 16 weeks. So what duration should the uh, planning horizon have? So that is actually up to the planning time fence. So what should be the minimum duration? So you can see here that uh, uh, sub-assemblies of components B, C and D can be made in parallel, but D cannot be made until we have E available. And of course, we cannot start the production of A unless we have B, C and D available. So that is the product structure. So we need uh, the planning horizon to be at least 20 feet, uh, 26 weeks long. So that is what is called the longest cumulative lead time of the product. So 16 weeks are required to make B, e, then B, C and D can be made in parallel, but the longest time out of these three is this eight weeks. So there is some slack for B and C, so slack of two weeks for B and three weeks for C. So 16 plus 8, 24 plus 2 weeks are required to make A. So at least 26 weeks are required to make A. So that is the minimum planning horizon. So another related question is when should company commit E to making D? So we want to make D. So we have E available, for example. So E is available. So when should E be issued, for example, from the store to start making D? So what is the, what we call the latest start in terms of uh, project management or production scheduling terminology? What is the latest start for, uh, for D in this case? So let us start for D is 10 weeks before delivery of the head. So for example, uh, A is to be delivered at the start of week 11, for example. So the production of D should start at the start of week one so that it is available by the end of week eight. And at the start of week nine, you can start making A and that is final at the end of week 10. So that is the latest start for, uh, for item D. Now an important practical point, total planning horizon should extend an extra 25 to 50% of time beyond uh, planning time fence. So that is important. So this point is important. Why? Why should be beyond some percentage, uh, beyond planning time fence? That is, we should have some liquid zone as well. So this gives the master schedule visibility to demand that is approaching the plan, uh, approaching the planning time fence. So we can see beyond planning time fence what we are expecting, and we can make up our mind and make a better plan by considering what is there in the liquid zone. So on what basis are demand and planning time fence is decided, so we have discussed it, that demand time fence is usually set when the material is reserved or production of the component is completed. And the planning time fence is usually set when the material is ordered or production is begun on the component, not the final product. Another important uh, point here is that by providing firm production dates and numbers, that is using the demand time fence and the planning time fence, the MPS serves as a contract between sales and operations. So that means that using these time fences and zones, 
for the sales force, the MPs provide assurance that they may make delivery commitments to customers. So that is very important. So sales people know how much they can commit to the customers based on the amount of product that will be available week by week. For operation, the commitment of the sales force to meet its uh, numbers provides assurance that they can avoid problems resulting from overproduction and excess of orders.